Hi, everybody. My name is Adrian Maldonado of National Museum Scotland, and I'm here to tell you a little story that myself and some of my colleagues at the University of Glasgow have been working on about the early Christian monastery of Iona off the west coast of Scotland, a place that was famously targeted uh, in the early days of the Viking Age and uh, what happened after those first raids. If you know anything about Iona, I suppose it's that it's a famous monastery off the west coast of Scotland. And, uh, you know, it, it's kind of remote now. You have to take a ferry from Oban uh, to the Isle of Mull. And then you have to drive across the island of Mull for about an hour or so. And then you have to take another ferry across the Sound of Iona to actually get to the island of Iona. It seems really remote now, but actually here in this place, it was central to a sea road that would have taken you by, uh, by sailing vessel down to the Irish Sea to the south, up to the western and northern isles of Scotland, and from the end of the 8th century, uh, uh, increasingly the sea roads led inexorably to Scandinavia. By the, uh, by the middle uh, and the end of the 9th century, all of this area marked in red, all of these seaways are basically controlled by Norse-speaking uh, 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 warlords. It seems kind of a catastrophic tale for anybody getting in the way. And certainly uh, because of the nature of the documents that we have, which were kept on the uh, monasteries of their day, we hear a lot about attacks on monasteries. And this has tended to color our image of the early Viking Age. Uh, uh, and so we know, for instance, that the very first places to be attacked anywhere in Britain uh, um, by uh, seafarers from Scandinavia were uh, indeed at Lindisfarne at 793, and and, uh, and Iona two years later at 795. Now, we know that these were two of the most important monasteries of their time, Lindisfarne, a central place of Northumbria, and Iona, a central place of the kingdom of Dalriada, but at this point, uh, also the kingdom of the Picts, who had extended their rule out uh, to the west of Scotland by this point. Uh, we know then that the raiders who are coming to these places were well informed. They were not sort of an uncontacted alien race that had just kind of stumbled upon these places. They're targeting the big name places where there are rich pickings to be had. That means they have local informants. And it seems that these raids, uh, although we call them hit and run raids, smash and grab raids, were actually a little bit more targeted and maybe even political right from the start. And that's why it's sort of uh, the archaeology and history of the Viking Age is really exciting to, to, to study right now. Uh, we know, for instance, that Iona uh, was not spared. We know, again, that first raid uh, in what is now Scotland takes place on Iona. So they go to the very sort of pinnacle uh, of the monastic network there, the Monastery of St. Columba. And then a few years later, again, Iona was burned by the heathens in 802. Uh, the same uh, annals record that the community of Iona to the number of 68 was killed by the heathens. And then a few years after that, the violent death of Blathmax on a flan at the hands of the heathens on Iona. Okay, um, These were not the last raids. These are just the first ones uh, and some of the earliest ones recorded for Scotland. Okay, So Iona was targeted early. It was targeted often and it was not spared. There is no sense that uh, it was a peaceful time on Iona. But does it mean that Iona was demolished, destroyed, abandoned? We have this image which is fueled not only by the primary sources, but also incredible survivals like this one. Also uh, from perhaps an eyewitness account, but in this case, what looks like a child's eye view 
from a monastery uh, off the west coast of Scotland called Inchmarnock, off of the Isle of Bute. Another island off an island, okay? Uh, and here, a child is doodling on a slate, presumably in the ninth century, as close as we can date it, and seems to depict a, a very sort of striking uh, uh, Viking uh, figure, uh, identifiable by the weapons swinging off of his hip, the wild uh, long hair, distinctive facial hair, but also because he seems to be striding towards what looks like uh, a, a multi oared long shot. And he seems to be leading away uh, a, a bearded figure dressed very different uh, from him uh, uh, with very different facial hair who seems to be holding uh, uh, a, 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 what looks like a house-shaped reliquary, uh, perhaps. This looks like a, a, an eyewitness account or at least uh, an imaginative drawing from a monastery uh, by a child of a Viking raid, okay? And if that really happened on Inchmarnock or if it was just something that this person had heard of, it certainly made an impact and sort of uh, resulted in this drawing, okay? But we also know from that monastery at Inchmarnock that about a century or so after that, uh, another kind of slaty stone was produced. It was a Christian cross, a ringed cross in this uh, uh, in this case. And this is the kind of Christian grave marker that would have been made uh, even before the Viking Age here. But this one's distinctive in that it has a Norse runic inscription, which seems to include uh, the incomplete uh, Norse name Guth something, okay? So either this is the rune carver or the person being commemorated. Basically here at Inchmarnock, in a place where a century before there was either a raid or stories of a raid had reached, uh, uh, there are now Norse speakers who wanted to be buried as Christians in this prestigious place. It tells us that even this small monastery was still attracting uh, elite patronage uh, now by Norse speakers who had presumably uh, uh, converted to Christianity. Okay, and we know, coming back to Iona, that there are similar bits of evidence, okay? They are scattered, and some of these are, uh, are, are have been known for a long time. Another ringed cross, this time a monumental high cross, was carved after those Viking, uh, those initial Viking raids. This style of cross we know in Ireland is a kind of cross that is being made in the 9th and into the 10th centuries, uh, uh, distinctively depicting that uh, Adam and Eve iconography that you can see there on the base. Uh, uh, so we know that this is post those early Viking raids on Iona, and they're still commissioning these grand works of art. Uh, there's this stone, uh, again, which is a cross slab of a kind that is already being made uh, on Iona there, uh, maybe in the 10th or in the 11th century. But in this particular case, this fragment bears the telltale runic inscription on the edge, naming uh, a, a person with a Norse personal name and a Norse family name. Okay, so once again, uh, from the small monastery of Inchmarnock to the very large famous monastery of Columba at Iona, there are now in the 10th and 11th centuries Norse-speaking uh, overlords who want to be buried as Christians, just as people were 100 and 200 years before the Vikings. This evidence has been out there for a long time. This has been known and published for a long time, but still this narrative uh, persists of Iona being sort of reduced by those early raids to a skeleton crew of mad hermits, basically, who were kind of putting their lives at risk for the glory of God, uh, kind of extremists, uh, basically, by attaching themselves to this lonely windswept isles, exposed to the waves, exposed to Viking attacks this way. And we know that the monastery was certainly rebuilt in the 13th century, but those centuries in between, those early Viking raids and that 13th century refoundation are kind of murky. Uh, but the thing is that there's actually a lot of evidence and uh, a, a lot of evidence that has been known and published for a long time by historians and art historians. And yet the story of Vikings attacking and demolishing Iona 
still persists. It's what we call a zombie narrative. It is the kind of story that continues to rise from the dead no matter how many times you try and kill it. Okay, so historians have been telling us for a long time that there continue to be bishops of Iona, abbots of Iona, uh, a keeper of the scriptorium on Iona. There's still an administration there. Uh, there are still kings and bishops being buried on Iona. There are still uh, pilgrims arriving on Iona, uh, all through the sort of 9th, 10th, 11th, into the 12th centuries. And yet, this story that Iona is demolished and abandoned persists. It's a zombie narrative. Not only, as we wrote in our article for Current Archaeology, not only does it refuse to die, it is still nibbling at our brains. This really stunts our understanding of both monasteries in the 9th, 10th, 11th centuries and the Vikings themselves. It reduces both of them to a sort of cartoon. And this is something that is kind of ingrained. It's institutional now. It's kind of a foundational myth of uh, Britain and Ireland somehow. So much so that I got this invitation on Facebook quite recently, uh, where Iona Abbey itself is inviting me to like its page. And uh, this is the sort of cover photo uh, of Vikings sort of burning a monastery. It is that ingrained uh, that even that is the story that the monastery kind of, uh, this is how the monastery sees itself you know uh, uh, uh talk about trauma re-emerging in the present you know so we put this article together me and my colleagues and uh we didn't just want to kind of corral evidence that had already been put out there we also wanted to take this opportunity to present some new and recent evidence so we put it all together but the question is why now and why us so the point is that uh, all of us who are named on this article and several others uh, who aren't have been working on these questions for a long, long time, uh, uh, many more than me, certainly. Uh, uh, one project I was involved in was uh, the Charles Thomas unpublished excavations on Iona, which took place in the 50s and 60s. Uh, you and Campbell and I were able to bring that to publication finally over half a century later uh, through the generous funding and assistance of several bodies, including Historic Environment Scotland. Uh, I was lucky enough to be Glenn Morangy Research Fellow at National Museum Scotland, resulting in this book, a reassessment of the artifacts of the 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th centuries in the National Museums, including monasteries like Iona. And then this ongoing project with some of my co-authors, uh, um, Iona's Namescape, reassessing the names, place names, historical sources, uh, and kind of uh, sort of telling the story uh, written on the map of how Iona came to be uh, uh, called what it is uh, uh, and what that can reveal about its history uh, from the early medieval period onwards. Just to take the first of these, the excavations on Iona led by the late Professor Charles Thomas uh, in the 1950s and 60s for various reasons were never able to be published. We were able to bring all that together and a team led by Ewan Campbell of Glasgow University uh, was able to re-excavate some of the trenches that they opened, again, more than a half a century before. And bringing all that evidence together has allowed us to create new resources and new assets uh, that were not available uh, uh, at the time of those excavations. Uh, most importantly, perhaps, is this large diagram of all of the radiocarbon dates we've now been able to get um, from that archival material. You put it all together, and I can put these vertical bars that show you the foundation of the monastery at AD 563 and the refoundation as a Benedictine monastery in 1201. And you can see from the curve of those dates in between that there is basically an unbroken occupation of Iona throughout this period. There doesn't seem to be any sort of Viking Age hiatus. And on top of that, we were able to sort of confirm as early medieval, uh, things like a wattle hut, which has been spoken of as Columba's own uh, writing cell, the street of the dead, the cobbled road that leads there that you can still walk on today, are genuinely early medieval bits of the pilgrimage landscape here, okay? No hiatus in occupation, certainly not even from the Viking Age, and even burial uh, of elites continued there in the ninth. 
to the 12th centuries. Uh, and, and this is coming from, again, looking mostly at published material, archival material, objects that are in the museum. Uh, uh, and it's just sort of a question of taking a look at them with fresh eyes without the sort of uh, uh, the dark cloud of those Viking raids uh, as an ending and instead looking at them as a new phase in the monastery's existence. For instance, there was a, a, this a sort of copper alloy uh, uh, strap fitting, uh, which was published in 1994 by Jerry O'Sullivan. Uh, since then, there have been a number of other discoveries of similar objects in Viking burials, including this one from another monastery on the east coast of Scotland at Oldham in East Lothian in a male weapon burial. These are found in men and women's graves of the Viking Age. And it's possible that this strap fitting, when reconstructed, looked something very similar to this. There may even have been uh, a furnished burial, a, a person who was buried in one of these belt sets, buried fully clothed, uh, as you get in the Viking Age. Okay, It doesn't mean that there was a pagan Viking buried here. By this point in the 10th century, it's quite likely that Christians were also being buried dressed occasionally, as we know from churches like uh, Workington in Cumbria, Carlisle Cathedral, and indeed Aldhame maybe now uh, Iona as well. There are other stray finds in museums. Uh, in the Hunterian Museum, there's this rare black bead, which is a, a, an exotic type that is found from Birka to Iceland. Uh, we know is being traded through Viking urban centers, but is also being used in uh, Viking graves, uh, almost invariably women's graves. Uh, so again, uh, a stray find found apparently in the walls of the cathedral during during restorations in the late 19th century, uh, but uh, 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 maybe a sign of a disturbed, uh, another dressed burial perhaps, uh, or at least a trade item. And this one on the right has been uh, uh, helpfully identified by uh, Griffin Murray and National Museum of Ireland as a 11th or 12th century a uh, uh, gabled shrine, uh, probably used for corporeal, corporeal relics, the bones of the saint. So it tells us that on Iona, even as late as the 12th century, before its refoundation, there are still shrines being commissioned of the latest styles in Ireland. So, so Iona is very much in touch with patterns elsewhere. And these two bits of sculpture, the one on the right I've shown you before, it has this runic inscription uh, in a local uh, Iona and Irish style. And the one on the left here is of an art style that is being used in the Viking Age in uh, Yorkshire and the Isle of Man. And indeed, the geology of this stone seems to be from one of those places, probably from the Isle of Man. And you can see uh, from, the, uh, uh, from, the line, from the drawing here that it depicts a boat with human figures, one quite large human figure with metalworking tools like tongs. This is imagery that's coming straight out of an Old Norse saga. Okay, so these are the kinds of stones that are being put up in the Viking Age on Christian sites but very heavily influenced by the North speaking cultural zone that Iona found itself in by the 10th century. Very strikingly, there is even uh, a rare, uh, but, uh, uh, but quite large hoard of silver coins, hundreds of silver coins deposited according to the mint dates around the year 986. Uh, and this is tied to perhaps or a historical event called the Christmas Eve Massacre, uh, uh, which took place in 986. It's been called a Viking raid, but by this point, uh, almost two centuries after uh, those initial Viking raids, we are talking about a completely changed world. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the king of the former king of York, Olav Kuren, uh, had, uh, had in the 940s been minting his own coins. And some of these coins, like the one you can see imaged on the left there, uh, coins like this were buried in that hoard. Um, he went on to be the king of Dublin, uh, was defeated finally in the Battle of Tara in 980, and retires as a penitent, basically uh, as a monk, 
to the uh, uh, to the monastery of Iona. And this doesn't happen if Iona isn't a prestigious place that is still occupied by a working administration. You know, uh, uh, it shows you that the vibrant uh, the vibrancy of that monastery that it is able to take uh, a, a penitent former king, an exiled king at this point, and the coins and the gold and silver that you can see on the right there. These are objects that are thrown into that hoard to kind of top it up in terms of weight. Okay, it shows you how much money and the kinds of ornate objects that are still being used and found on Iona uh, at this time. It is a center of wealth and power and influence. And that raid in 986, as my uh, co-author Thomas Owen Clancy explains in an article from 2013, isn't a Viking raid out of a blue. It's fully entrenched in the sectional politics of power uh, over the kingship of Dublin and the kingship of Ireland itself. Uh, basically, this is a proxy battle between two factions vying for power in Ireland. At this point, Iona is not only still occupied, it is being used as a political football. And this attack is just sort of the fallout of the viciousness of these uh, uh, battles. We went back to the gray literature, and the more you look, the more you find. There are now five or six of these stick pins and a couple of ringed pins as well. These are all Viking Age, uh, down to the 11th and 12th century styles of pin that are certainly being made in urban centers like Dublin, but almost certainly being made in the Hebrides, given their popularity here. Despite how many of these we have now in the west coast of Scotland in the Hebrides, Iona stands out as a very clear focus of these. There are more than you would expect for such a small island. And these are all found in and around the uh, the monastery itself. It looks like there's something more than just kings being buried here. There's something sort of lower down the scale. These are kind of everyday items, nice things, but you know, more accessible than the gold and silver in that hoard. And it looks like there was possibly a market alongside the monastery here, certainly by the 10th and 11th centuries. By the end of the 11th century, a later saga uh, seems to record the existence of a market here. This was pointed out to us by our friend uh, Alex Wolf of St. Andrews University. Uh, the saga records the travels of the King of Norway uh, in 1098, Magnus Berlegs. He went around the Hebrides and he came to the Holy Isle, to Iona, where he went to the marketplace. So again, the more you look, the more that is out there. It just shows you that we have to kind of look with fresh eyes as much as uh, commissioning new excavations. Look at the stuff that we have, but look at it in uh, with all of the evidence available. And this is where new research can still uh, uh, sort of lead to new discoveries. And again, that uh, ongoing project, Iona's namescape, is turning up, amongst other things, little known uh, Norse place names on Iona itself. It just shows you that Norse is one of several languages being spoken uh, in Iona as elsewhere in the Hebrides, uh, even in places that we know are still being populated by bishops and abbots with Irish names, okay? Iona is at the center of these larger networks. Um, it just means overall, basically, that that zombie narrative of Iona being destroyed and abandoned is no longer tenable. Uh, it just means that instead of looking at the Viking raids as the end of Iona's story. It is not a falling of a curtain. It is the start of another act in the long and storied saga of the famous monastery of Iona. I think I'll leave it there. Here's some more reading for you. Thanks a lot.